أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to session 11 of our eschatology podcast and inshallah I want to now look at the concept of time and now this being an incredibly sophisticated concept to really understand, it's not something we can cover in a brief 20-30 minute session or even a one hour lecture or several hours for that matter. But I will try my best to try and condense at least a basic understanding of the concept and how it relates to the science of eschatology. And inshallah we'll dedicate the next two sessions, this one and the following one, to the concept of time and dimensionality. Now, if you remember, we spoke about eschatology in the earlier sessions and we said that eschatology fundamentally regards the study of time itself. Because when we look at the Hadith of Jibreel, the fourth question that was asked was regarding a sa'a and a sa'a is then understood as the final hour. So we argue that if there is a final hour, then there must be a beginning or an initial hour and then there must be the space in between. So we are essentially looking at time, but time itself as an entity cannot be seen, cannot be heard, cannot be touched or felt. There is no sensory interaction that one can have with time. And it has been often argued that either time is just an illusion, it is a construct of the mind, it is something that is imaginally imposed upon our perception. Physicists have tried to argue that time is like a fourth dimension. So you've got the three spatial dimensions, which is length, width and height, or X, Y and Z, uh, if you give it coordinates. And then there is a fourth dimension, which is time that determines the position of an object within those three uh, dimensions. This is as far as physicality is concerned, and there are many theories that have developed from that, particularly Einstein's theory of relativity, general relativity, and then special relativity, in which Einstein argues that time is a relative entity. However, when you now incorporate a metaphysical dimension, as we spoke about in the previous session regarding the noumena and the phenomena, the physical and the metaphysical, you've got the alam al-khalq and the alam al-amr or alam al-shahada and alam al-ghaib and or alam al-mulk and alam al-malakut. So insofar as the mulk, insofar as the, the shahada, the alam al-shahada, or the, the alam al-khalq, the created material realm is concerned, one can argue that Einstein's theory is correct because you can put the quantitative aspects together and come up with solutions or rather equations that provide solutions that are accurate and can be measured. However, now when you bring in the other realms, the superimposed realms upon this material domain, where you now consider the samawat and you consider the alam al-amr and you consider the spiritual dimension, those equations tend to break down because we argued that the logic of this realm does not function in that other realm. The logic breaks down. So any equation that we build in this world, however sound that equation may be, insofar as the equation itself is concerned, it relies on the assumption that the entity that is being examined or observed or measured is only a physical entity and does not have any metaphysical aspects or attributes to it which is not correct insofar as time is concerned. If you examine the cosmos, you've got three major components, three primary components. You've got space, you've got time, and then you've got matter. And all three are arguably necessary to be present at the time of the origin of the cosmos. So at the first primordial event that takes place, to bring the cosmos into fruition, into manifestation, you need to have time, space and matter. Because if you have time and space, but you don't have matter, what would you put there? And if you had time and matter, but no space, where would you put it? And if you had matter and space, but no time, then when would you put it? When would the event be marked? 
uh, at what junction would it be marked? How would its duration of existence be evaluated without time? The best way to understand time, because the major question, the main question that people often ask is what is time? And the question itself is flawed insofar as what is being investigated. Because the question what necessitates an investigation into the quiddity of a thing, into its, in, in Arabic it would be called mahiyatun. What, what, it, what is it? Mahiya, what is it? And the attempt to ask that question is to derive its essence. But the problem is the entity itself is not physical. So you cannot go into its abstract if you do not have the physical object in front of you. It's like trying to understand a thing that is not in front of you. It's not there. You've never seen it. You've never touched it. You've never felt it. You've never even seen a diagrammatic representation of it. And you're trying to ask, what is it? Which is the wrong question. And all aspects that have been derived regarding the entity itself is not the thing itself. It is either the measure of the thing or the count of the thing. You see, so you have a count of time or the flow of time or the measure of time or the direction of time or what's known in physics also as the arrow of time. These are all entities or attributions to the entity itself. So we're trying to understand the entity by examining its attributes. But we only reach insofar as the attributes are concerned, but we do not actually reach the end point of it or of what the entity is itself. So it's kind of a futile attempt to try and figure out what is time. Because time itself is best described as a component that is part of eternity. And eternity is one of those concepts that the human intellect simply cannot comprehend. We cannot rationalize it. There are many such other events like non-existence, for example, eternity, um, infinity. These are concepts that we cannot rationalize, we cannot comprehend because we are existent beings. We, we cannot understand what non-existent means because for us to understand non-existence, our consciousness has to either affirm or negate that reality. And we would have to be in a state of non-existence in order to understand non-existence. And if we are in a state of non-existence, then our consciousness is equally in a state of non-existence. So if the consciousness is non-existent, how can it affirm or negate? It's a very difficult concept to wrap your mind around. And the same applies to infinity. Because we are finite beings, we're not infinite beings. We're in a state of finite existence. And so we cannot really understand what infinity really means. And this is why mathematically, infinity is regarded as an irrational number. It is non-rational. You cannot rationalize it. And then likewise, the same applies to eternity. Because we are not presently existent in an eternal state of existence. We are existent in a temporal state of existence. For us to understand eternity, we would have to be in an eternal state of existence. And a lot of people try to rationalize that by thinking that eternity means a lot of time or an infinite amount of time. Eternity does not mean a lot of time. Eternity is not a quantity. It is not an object. It is not a set thing. And it is difficult for us to understand eternity because we are in a state of temporal existence. And so this is where now the concept of time comes in. Time is a temporal uh, modus which is part of eternity. It is a modus in which events have been set to occur. And the best way to understand this is to think of a river. You have the river that is flowing in a certain direction. And then you've got the water that is in the river. So the river has been set to have a certain length from one point to another point. But the river itself does not move. What moves is the water inside the river. So the water in this case is like the events. The water are the events. If every droplet of water in the river is an event that is taking place and it is in motion through time. Likewise, every individual that comes into now this world has, it has been brought into time, has come from a state of non-temporal existence and has entered into a temporal state of existence similar to somebody pouring a cup of water into the river. And then that water now carries on through the course of the river until that 
quantity of water has been withdrawn somewhere down the down the river and so every human being comes in to this state of existence in a temporal state so you come in at a certain marker of time and then you you run your course of life over a duration of time and then you leave at a certain moment in time this is your motion through time so every entity every every part of creation is in motion not through space but through time time itself in this case is an absolute entity whereby space and matter are relative entities because space will either expand or will contract depending on the volume or the space that is accumulated or taken over by the object that is occupying space and matter itself will either change shape or form or density or mass depending on its configuration so these two entities are relative to each other however both these entities exist in time and this is where we argue now something like relativity and general relativity insofar as time is concerned these equations if you examine them physically sure the mathematics can make sense but when you now factor in a reality greater than simple cause and effect these equations start breaking down and it is important to have this understanding because what we're examining now when we put it into the framework of eschatology is we're not looking at the motion of time we are looking at the events that are occurring in time and it's important because a lot of people get into the study of eschatology and then they start trying to calculate the timeline they try to determine you know when a certain event would occur or you can start sort of predict and say okay i give it 10 years from now it's going to happen or on, in this year you know 20 something this is going to happen this is this is the fallacy now this is the 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 flawed epistemology because you're trying to calculate the timeline you're trying to calculate the length of the of the river and you're trying to determine where a particular object is going to be during the course of its motion through that river or they will try to calculate the years you know by applying things like numerology to determine particular dates this is this is a flawed epistemology not just in so far as eschatology is concerned but in so far as just general perception of reality trying to calculate that is folly because as the quran definitively states that none can know the occurrence of the hour and if none can know the occurrence of the hour the final hour none can know the occurrence of any other hour in that timeline if you do not know the beginning of a thing and the and the ending of a thing you cannot measure it it's as simple as that if you don't know the final hour and you likewise do not know the initial hour you cannot measure the space in between you cannot measure how long that duration is time itself is such a thing that it beholds itself as the most precious commodity that man can possess yet man cannot acquire time nor can you spend any more than is allocated to you nor can you prevent its expenditure like you cannot stop spending time you cannot withhold it you can't save it in that sense though we use these words arbitrarily in language or conventionally in language you know i'm trying to save some time these are just as far as language is concerned as far as the perception of reality is concerned but in reality you are spending time you cannot stop spending time it's the only commodity you have and it's the only thing that you can have in your possession in so far as how much has been given to you and you cannot prevent its expenditure nor can you acquire more time even the individual who follows the clock right to the to the particulate to the most accurate count of it cannot really have a grasping or a comprehension of what it means to be in time because that clock that instrument is an instrument it is just an instrument of measurement it is an instrument that identifies certain patterns or certain markers and you use that as identifying marks as points whereby you can navigate the duration of an event that is occurring people often say things like i mean mankind is often in disgratitude at a loss of time you know i don't have time to do this i don't have time to do that time it's something that is that mankind mistrades and mistreats even sacrifices in pursuit of what this modern age terms as success so that time could be spent in comfort in in luxury in leisure 
which in itself is a confounded thought because it defeats the very purpose of you being sent into this world. You were not sent here to acquire comfort. Comfort was in paradise and you were removed from there and you were sent here to a place of turbulence whereby you need to work through the turbulence, not look for comfort. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has said in Hadith al-Qudsi, يَسُبُّ بَنُ آدَمْ الدَّهَرْ وَآنَا الدَّهَرْ بِيَدِ اللَّيْلْ وَالنَّهَرْ The son of Adam, the human being, wastes الدَّهَرْ الدَّهَرْ is identified as eternity. So there's a portion of eternity which we are calling time, which is a temporal portion because it has a beginning and an end. Eternity does not have a beginning and an end. And that's why it is eternal. It is an eternity. It doesn't have beginning and end. It's not a linear progression. But in this eternity, there is a certain allocation that has been given a beginning and an end and has been given a certain direction. And that's what we're calling temporality, the temporal period of time. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, we are wasting ad-dahar, we are wasting eternity. Wa'ana ad-dahar, I am eternal. In my hands are the night and the day. And then he also said in another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ana inda dhanni abdi bi. I am in the opinion of my servant. So if you think of time as something that is precious, that is beyond your grasping, that is beyond your control, then you hold the same or if not more regard for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there was a duration, this temporal duration existed before mankind even came in. We didn't invent time. We didn't come up with the concept. The beginning of time was not the beginning of humankind. That's just a period of temporal time within temporal time. It's a short period. He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ هِينٌ مِنَ الدَّهَرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءًا مَذْكُورًا Has there not come upon mankind a, a period of eternity? From eternity, مِنَ الدَّهَر From eternity, there was a period in which he was not even worth mentioning. He was a non-existent entity. And, and, and it continues even afterwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Everything upon this material realm is going to, is going to perish. عَلَيْهَا فَانْ is going to be, is going to be annihilated. But forever, وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ Forever will remain. وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ The existence of your Lord. The waj is the existence, the, the face of your Lord is the face, the waj. Raghab al-Isfahani says the waj is what signifies the existence of a thing. When you see a thing, you know that it exists. When you see its face, you know that it is an existing thing. The, the face of your Lord, the existence of your Lord himself, full of majesty and honor. Dhul Jalali wal Ikram. So, in essence, it is not about understanding the flow of time or the direction of time or when it is going to end or when is this marker going to take place or when does this sign come up. I see, I've seen a lot of people, especially when these recent attacks, uh, these atrocities were taking place in Gaza. I mean, it affected everyone, not only those who are suffering from it, but everyone who could see the inhumanities taking place by the Zionists, by the Jews, the Zionist Jews and Israel upon these innocent people. It puts, uh, it puts people in an emotional state so that they feel helpless in the face of such atrocity and the natural draw is towards we need an establishment of authority to combat that, to face that off. In other words, we need Khilafah. And, and the only greatest Khilafah that we know that has been prophesied by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Imam al-Mahdi as the Khalifa who will lead this army, this nation into victory against these oppressors, these, these vile people. And so everybody is now trying to anticipate the coming of the Mahdi. And everyone has been asking, is the Mahdi here yet? Is he coming? Based on this hadith, based on that hadith, we can calculate. I think it's going to be next year. I think it's going to be like that. People have been doing that for so long. That's not the objective here. This is, this is flawed epistemology. And by doing so is an act that diminishes one's intellect and one's intelligence. Ibn Ata'illah says in his Hikam, he says, لا يشككنك في الوعد عدم وقوء الموعود به وإن تعين زمنه 
لِأَلَّا يَكُونُ ذَلِكَ قَدْهًا فِي بَسِيرَتِكَ وَإِخْمَادًا لِنُورِ سَرِيرَتِكَ He says, don't doubt in the promise that Allah has given you. Don't doubt in it. Even though it may appear to you that it is time for that promise to be fulfilled. So Allah has promised that this leader will come. Allah has promised that victory will be given to the Muslims and the believers. Allah has promised that these atrocities will end. Don't doubt that. Though you feel like, okay, it's reached its zenith, it's reached its maximum. Now it's just, it's time now for that promise to be fulfilled. Though it is not yet, it seems like it is time for, the, for that promise to be fulfilled. But it doesn't get fulfilled. Ibn Ata'illah says, do not doubt that or don't allow yourself to have doubt in that. Because if that happens, if that doubt starts manifesting in your heart, it will cloud, it will obscure your, your, your insight, your intelligence, your intuition. It will obscure that and it will extinguish the light of your consciousness, of your heart. It will extinguish that light, it will turn you into a dark creature. Because you're going to start doubting the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the wisdom that he has, he has enacted in terms of how he wants things to unfold. Ibn Ata'illah also says in the, in the hikam before this one, he says, لا يكن تأخر أمد العطاء مع الإلهاه في الدعاء مؤجبا لياسك فهو ضمن لك الإجابة فيما يختار لك لا فيما تختاره لنفسك وفي الوقت الذي يريد لا في الوقت الذي تريد he says no this delay in the offering that Allah has promised you though you are exerting and asking for it with intensified dua you are supplicating intensely and and you see that you feel like there's a delay in that he says no don't let that fill you with grief don't let that cause you despair he has guaranteed a response for you in what he chooses for you not in what you choose for yourself and at the time that he intends or desires it not at the time that you desire it and so understanding this is primary to bringing soundness to one's state of being when you start seeing these events taking place it is not about trying to figure out when things are going to happen because part of the agitation of the human being, one of the most agitated states you can be is in a state of not knowing. And the greatest not knowing or the greatest unknown is the unknowability of the unfolding moment. You don't know what's going to happen next. And so the intellect attempts to do this to try and figure out when things are going to transpire so that you've got something to cling to, to get rid of that agitation. You don't want that. You want to place your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's going to make things happen as and when he sees it appropriate to make them happen. So what, we, what are we doing then in this case as so far as eschatology is concerned? We're saying that though it is the study of time, we're not directing our efforts towards the study of time itself. Rather, we are directing our efforts to studying the events that are occurring in time and the significant links between the events and then the rate of their occurrence. In order to determine now what course, what direction is, is the world headed towards? Because we want to try and identify two elements. The first is what we would call the event horizon. And the second is what we would call the singularity. The singularity is the final piece, the final manifestation, what you would call now, if you were looking at the subject of the Dajjal, you would say, okay, هذا خروج Dajjal. This is it. This is the emergence of the Dajjal. This is the singularity. It is the final point. But prior to that, you've got something called the event horizon. This is the sort of boundary or the marker in which when events now start happening and they cross the event horizon, it becomes a point of no return. There's no reversing the effects of these events that will start taking place. So if you want to examine this more closely at what's transpiring in the lands of Palestine and the atrocities of the Israelites, when you look at these events as they are transpiring, you need to question and see, is this event reversible? In other words, can Palestine be restored 
back to what it was prior to 1948 is it is it a possibility and in all aspects when analyzed it is an impossibility which means the event that is occurring the major event the larger event of israel trying to eradicate the palestinians and then all the minor events that fall under that are that all these events are irreversible which means we are already crossing the point of no return we are crossing the event horizon and you apply the same thing to all other events taking place around the world whether it's in so far as technology monetary economics politics geopolitics all other aspects of reality that human beings are manifesting in this world you examine these events and you say is it really reversible can we reverse the pollution of the earth can we reverse all the natural habitats the natural world the the forests and the and the animals and the beasts and all these can we reverse all that from the damage we have caused on it can we reverse the flow of technology when we reach its zenith can we reverse and go back to a state of not using modern technology is it reversible and when you examine this you see it's not reversible then you know that you are in an event horizon now the events are culminating like water flowing through a funnel or if you want to use the analogy of the river the 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 river has now reached a point whereby you're looking at rapids taking place there's a waterfall now coming up and you find that the flow of water in the early stages of the river was kind of slow and gradual but now coming towards the rapids with i mean the word itself rapids should give you the, give you an idea the flow of water is increasing the rate of water flow is increasing meaning the events are moving faster and faster more and more events are taking place there is incredible turbulence that is taking place and you're now about to cross over that boundary line that marker into a point of no return because once the water flows over the edge it cannot come back up this is all the time we have for today inshallah we will resume in the next session and continue on the subject of time subhanaka wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik rabbana taqabbal minna innaka antas samiyun alim wa tub alayna ya maulana innaka antat tawwabur rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin barakallahu fikum wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jazakumullahu khairan